This is the OGM Thursday call on Thursday, September 24th, February 24th, 2022. Um, in Portland, it's snowing this morning, which is a little wow. strange, but yeah. We've, we've been having a cold snap. Last summer, we had a heat dome. Um, right now, we're having a cold snap, and Judy's on the call. And Judy, we're having Minneapolis weather here in Portland. Hi, Judy. Could you still connect to the audio? Uh, Judy, hi, good morning. We're having Minneapolis weather here in Portland today. It's snowing? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty unusual. <laughs> yeah. We have frost in San Rafael. Okay. Well, we got seven or eight inches. Well, it depends on where you are in the cities. Over on Monday, we got somewhere around 10 here in Woodbury, um, seven in St. Paul and so forth. It's, it was a little spotty but it's melting fairly fast or subliming probably more than melting. Um, but it's, yeah, it's winter in Minnesota, but I'm surprised you're getting snow on the West coast. That's pretty unusual. There's a, there's a, we, last summer we had the heat dome. Now we're getting like a cold cap, uh, the polar vortex. I don't think this one's a polar vortex, but weather is getting strange and spooky for a different week. We'll talk about ministry for the future and other sorts of things, climate. Um, <laughs> We have, uh, we have a different set of, of things, I think, on the table for our conversation today. And maybe a couple things. One, we're not gonna talk about Russia launching an attack on Ukraine and possible implications and all of that, which is an important world event happening right now. I just want to take a breath over that um, because there's many different ways of seeing and interpreting what that is, um, not many of them cheerful. Right. <laughs> um, second, I want to make room in this conversation for us to learn from the events that we're going to study. And that may mean saying things to ourselves that we don't like hearing or that aren't, aren't sort of a conventional, normal take on, on what's happening. So I'm, I just totally want to make room for that because I think it's, a, it's an important part of how we function and it's, it's a piece of what I was trying to do as kind of the convener of the community and things like that and, and uh, to hold that space and, and make it work. Um, and so kind of my goal here is what can we learn from these events? what sort of lessons are, are held in them and then uh not just what can we learn but can we turn those lessons into some norms or artifacts or other kinds of things that are useful to our community and others because i think one of our major reasons for being together is not that we like to chat a lot which is actually a guilty pleasure um, but that we would like to turn things out for the world and try to synthesize and make things more useful for others and so forth and i think that's a very common thread for for everybody who joins all of these calls um so with that i think i'll um i'll go quiet for just a second see who'd like to step in and just um voice any any lessons learned from uh oh and and gil um so uh, if you haven't been watching the OGM Google group mailing list, then you're not actually uh, necessarily up to speed on the events that are going on. So I'm going to try to describe them. Um, <clears throat> I'm unclear I can describe them neutrally. I'm going to try to describe them. Uh, but it's, it's basically um, a, a, an old acquaintance of mine from the tech world. He and I had a catch up call a few weeks ago I think it was only a few weeks ago, I'd have to check my calendar. And that went uneventfully and I described OGM. And he said, um, you know, uh, I, I asked if he'd like to be on the list. He said, sure. And uh, he and I are on a couple other lists. Um, and so he joined the OGM list. And then, um, then there was a quickly escalating set of interactions between him, Miles Feidelman, and uh, a few of our OGM members, and then other OGM members sort of came in to moderate, help, support, do whatever else. Uh, and, uh, and then we had a really interesting set of things happen, uh, which sort of, and I'm, I, I'm, I don't know that they ended, but, but there was a, an interesting moment yesterday where Miles was like, you know, take me off the list, and I did, um, with some misgivings. <laughs> 
stressful with some misgivings, Ken, um, because he was both, I think, and, and, and one of the lessons I want to talk about, I, we'll get to in a second, but I just want to hear um, other people's lessons from, from this. Um, because, um, and, and philosophically, this group generally leans in a similar direction. And what's funny here is that I think Miles very much leans in the same direction. Miles was on, in the, you know, pulling on the same rope just in a very strange way for, for us here. Um, so uh, Gil, if, if that hopefully sets a uh, uh, better expectation for what the conversation about, that, that's kind of our framing is, is the, the series of uh, things that mostly um, played out on email. Uh, and I, I know that there were lots and lots of side emails uh, provoked by this dynamic, these incidents, because I got a bunch of them. And I know that a bunch of you got a bunch of them. And I know that we were all trying to figure out what's going on and how do we deal with this. Yeah, Jerry, I asked the question because I just didn't know if you were referring to the immediate current events in the world or the events on OGM. So that clarifies. Um, uh, Ken only saw 498 of the emails. I only saw 493. I think I missed the first one that, you know, I don't know. I, I saw the ruckus, but I don't know what, what the precipitation of the ruckus was. So maybe somebody could say that briefly and then I'll just sit back and. Doesn't matter. Um, Did you just say it doesn't I, matter? I echo that thought. I don't think it matters. Yeah. So it matters in the sense that in the sense that how this started um, might play a role in how everybody reacted, including Miles. So, so um, I don't know that we need to detail it, but I don't think it doesn't matter. Just my own take here is that, is that, is that hey, um, and I don't mean he said, she said, I mean kind of, um, so, uh, Something got started at the beginning of this that went off the rails. Um, let, me, let me clarify my ask yeah. that helps. I don't care what the content was, but uh, clearly people got very, very tweaked very early on. I don't know why, because I didn't see the Miles messages. So well, yeah. can, I, can I jump in just because I'm, I've been absent from OGM for a number of months, literally, and just started to step back in this week. And yesterday's open call <clears throat> was quite that that dialogue that came out of some events <clears throat> was very uncharacteristic and so I kind of feel like I have a an outsider's but insider's fresh perspective and to me it wasn't about the content although that was partly what triggered it it was more about the style of social interaction what are our informal rules about the social contracts we have with one another on how we're going to debate issues where we have differing points of view? And it, my sense was just that um, he had a particular point of view, but then he jumped in rather quickly with a very assertive, if not aggressive style of corresponding with people about the content and it drifted away from the content and got into, you know, what kind of freedom of debate really exists if you can't get really energized about your polarized points of view. And so there was a grain of what he was saying that I agreed with, um, but it was very uncomfortable because it was not the sort of code of cordiality <laughs> that OGM has in terms of how respectfully we debate with one another. That would have been my take on it. And I um, agree, Judy, I like what you said a lot. And also I think he was raising a bunch of really useful, interesting questions. They just, they just were raised in a way that wasn't working for how this group works and not necessarily in, you know, in the world, um, but it was enormously disruptive to the group dynamic. Um, John, um, do you want to open up a bit of a meta uh, And actually, I think Stacy, did you raise your hand earlier, or were you just agreeing? No, Judy said everything that we're okay. good. Uh, let me go to Neil first, and then John Kelly, and see about sort of uh, framing for this conversation. But go ahead, Neil. Hi, everybody. Long time no see. Um, I didn't read every email, uh, but I've seen this dynamic. Oh, 173 times, I think, uh, in different groups I've been in over the years. Um, I agree 100% with what John just said. We need a meta discussion first. Uh, 
one of the reasons I dropped out of OGM on online conversations was because of a perception of a lack of directed, uh, focused action. It's nothing to do with the group, except it's everything to do with the group. And the meta perspective is who's in, who's out. Can disruption actually create uh, innovation or uh, is everything we're already doing already enough? If it's not, how do we disrupt coherence compassionately? If we're not playing by the unwritten rules that have never been put into a constitution, uh, then how can we know that we're breaking those rules? If we are operating from a worldview that thinks it's bigger than everything that's going on here, how do we not feel threatened, challenged uh, in our identity when somebody tries to shut us down? And if the group already has uh, an overt, not, uh, sorry, covert, not overt strategy for how it maintains its integrity around whatever center of gravity its worldviews are at, then uh, it will be challenged by an inno innovative outsider who is obviously very articulate, very smart, knows what he's talking about. But for whatever reason, I didn't see the dynamic and I agree with Gil's question here. I'm interested to know what was it that triggered the nature of the threatening conversations in each direction? Because this is challenge, this is resurfacing trauma. This is resurfacing, I've been shut down before. This is, you're challenging the culture of this group as I understand it, while it's never been clearly stated. So again, a whole bunch of unwritten rules and assumptions within a broader context of social ecological collapse. <laughs> uh, and are we doing enough? And if not, why not? And how do we challenge that and then re-cohere? And so to me, this is very much around divergence and convergence and the pulse and the difficulties that people here will have in that if they are close or so close to and inside a culture which might be blind to its own inabilities. And that's no criticism of anybody here, but when I get to a group that can't see beyond the fact that they think they're already doing it, um, and they're not, then I have to go. But I kick and scream until I go because I'm saying, guys, can't you see that if you could just get this little bit of extra, uh, imagine what you could do, imagine what we could do together if, you know, and that is a real frustration. And I've learned over time with my maturity to walk away. Um, however, others will hang around long enough, especially if they think this is a, a new lever to pull with amazing potentials that I can see. And I'll bet you he could see the potentials. Um, that can't be realized because, and so again, that meta perspective says, zoom out, look at all the players and what is it we could be doing together better if we had a bit more direction or a bit more structure to governance and groups like this generally shy away from the more structured rules, more structured guidelines, because that's where you are in terms of the, where we are in terms of the, uh, the worldview. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Makes a lot of sense. Um, John, then Ken. Good morning. Uh, well, there's, I have the sense that there's two, well, there's a huge issue here, right? And it's beyond my capacity to uh, deal with it in a responsibly succinct way in this little speech I'm going to give. So instead of taking the big issue, I'm going to compress it down to uh, uh, a menu of, of potential interventions. And I'm going, to, I'm going to steer away from the governance. We can come back to that. But I just want to say, um, Jerry has on occasion said, OK, let's just stop. Let's just take a moment of silence. You know, and and uh, I respect that. I, I think that's a that's a even if I might disagree about when and how long, you know, it, the, the basic idea of, hey, let's stop and let's do something else for a short amount of time, a minute. You know, I think that's appropriate. I think we might benefit by having multiple kinds of things like that. Um, a poem is good, but you got to have it ready, you know, in advance. It's 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 kind of demanding. Um, but here's here's another thought. I, I was trying to think of um, uh, a a kind of a preferencing survey. Uh, kind of a, I don't want to do a mood thing. I don't want to say, well, how do you feel about this? You know, I mean, that's just not going to work, you know, but um, if, if, if somebody could, could put up a, uh, a set of options and um, say, and, and you're not voting, you're not voting in terms of action. You're, you're saying which of these things is closer to the truth 
or you're saying, which of these things is the path of inquiry into what we're talking about that you think will be most fruitful? Now, I admit it's it's a challenge to come up with those, you know, and to lay those out. Um, quick story. I I was I when I was doing more active consulting, we had a we had a guy like Miles, <laughs> and he actually picked up his team and took them out of the room and said he was not going to cooperate with the uh, future mapping. <laughs> and my my uh, bosses said, John, you're the you go get them. <laughs> you go talk those guys into coming back into the room. So that was an interesting challenge. Uh, but you basically had to change. You had to address their criteria for not participating or, or for, you know, actively disrupting the group. And the way I went at it was I said, we will suffer from the absence of your insight. And we want it. We, 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 it's not the solution for you to go to the cafeteria and not do this. It's a solution for you to say, what didn't we see and how can you put it into a scenario? And they kind of grumbled, but they came back into the room and they did it. Um, but I'm thinking along those lines and, and just a, f a further out notion. Um, I think it's great if an individual can come up with this. We, we might even we might even think about a breakout as as the as the one minute um, or, or as the short alternative. In other words, all right, should should we do a should we do a recon, reconfigure breakout for for five minutes? We all go into breakouts and we say, well, what's the path here? What's what's the what's the pregnant path of inquiry here? that would get us somewhere. All right, come on back. Anybody got a path? Any of the teams got a path you want to suggest? And I'm talking about team, I mean, two or three people. You know, you don't need, you don't need big teams. You only, you only need, I think it's, if you put it on one person, it's, it's maybe too much pressure, but two people or three people could say, I think we should go this way. Another, yeah, I think we should go this way. All right, let's go that way. And this is now a direction of inquiry, not, a, not an action plan, not necessarily a governance solution and we can come back and look at that that's also a very uh good place to look but anyhow those are my uh menu options suggested menu options um and they're free <laughs> you can do what you like with them thank you thanks john um ken then stewart good morning good afternoon where you might be evening i think for neil at this point or close to it um nice to see you neil and some other folks that have been here for a while um, my yay of, of uh, in response to Miles' leaving is because he left of his own accord. I, I also feel that he should have hung around and we should work this out. I would have liked that very much, but I was also completely fed up with his bullshit. Um, I'm just speaking on my, my opinion here. I very much agree with Neil that, you know, we have been extremely lucky in this group. We've found a group of people that uh, get on well with each other, that respect each other, that have really um, sometimes very challenging dialogues but do so in a way where no one's character is impugned and nobody gets personally attacked and so when miles started that i found myself really upset um i recognize as neil points out we do not have a bunch we've got a lot of tacit agreements that are not explicit so someone coming in does not know what the culture is and therefore they start launching and um when that happens i think you know, this is a great opportunity for us to pause and say what are the things that we want to make what are our tacit agreements we want to make explicit so that new people coming in can go somewhere and look and say okay this is what i need to do if i want to be here and maybe even like a, a terms and agreements you know um of if you're coming into this group please read these and agree to it, abide by these rules and if there's something you have a question about or you feel strongly should be altered raise it we'll be happy to talk about that and see what works but um you know, I was in New York City actually staying with Michael Grossman and Michael and I are now really good buds. We had a fantastic time together. And I started to see these emails because I was really not online very much. We were too busy talking. And I was like, where's all this fuck you and you critical motherfucker coming from? And no one ever talks like that on this list. And I found it offensive. And when people tried numerous times to say, hey, Miles, you know, your way of showing up here is not working for a lot of folks. As Stacy says, he doubled down. He, he took a page out of the right wing playbook and just, you know, counterattacked and, and hit back hard and compared himself to George Bernard Shaw. And he's looking for, you know, Gertrude Stein's salons and the Algonquin Roundtable. I'm like, 
you don't recognize what's here. You have no idea of the quality of people in this group. And what makes you think any of those people in the past would give you an invitation to show up the way you're behaving? You know, you're smart. You're, you have some really good ideas. But man, you obfuscate and put up this huge spray of, of thought terminating cliches, which we learned about yesterday on that, that call. Um, so that to me just is, a, is something that I think in addition to our explicit agreements, we should think about when someone does behave in a manner that is clearly challenging to people like that, that we have some steps of, okay, you know, you've been, several people have talked to you about this. Um, uh, we're going to meet you for three months or we're going to censor you and, or we're going to shun you or we're going to expel you. That There should be levels and steps, um, some kind of path that there's a way that they can understand um, what the consequences are and, make up their mind and say, yes, I, I recognize I'm behaving badly and I have remorse for that and I apologize. But man, this just does, this last thing is opens up a huge opportunity for us to learn. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Stuart, and then let's pause and consider John's offer about how do we decide on paths of inquiry into this question? And you're muted. Thank you. Uh, so I'm not going to say too much because I, I put most of what I had to say in an email that I sent yesterday on, on, on the list. Um, but um, being fairly new to the group, um, you know, yeah, you keep your mouth shut until you, <laughs> you get a sense of what the rhythm is, what the culture is. That, that being said, Somebody, uh, a, few, a few people ago, I don't know who it was, used the word constitution, you know? And, and it seems to me in part, because this is actually one of the things I do and do well, um, that the group needs a constitution. In, in other words, I, I'm still not sure. So what is the vision and intention of this group? You know, what, what's the goal here? One of the things that, that, that Miles brought up, and I think it was an important one, was the notion that um, I think he said that some that he heard a little grumbling because this group hasn't been able to do something, to produce something. Um, and I think that may be an important piece, but that's part of the um, discussion that needs to have. What's our intention? What's our vision? What are the promises we make to each other about how we will be um, uh, together? What role? Did, do people play? So I, I think it's important to actually um, have that. It doesn't have to be a big deal to do it, um, but um, I'm not even sure how long the group has been in existence, but it feels to me like this is a perfect opportunity, as Ken said, to make explicit uh, what in part has been implicit because that's where groups often get into trouble. <clears throat> thanks, Stuart, and thanks also for the, like tons of resources you poured into the list and the work you've done. I, I think there's, there's clearly a lot that, that, that is central to your life that is really useful to us here. So really appreciate that. Um, Judy. We had a conversation yesterday in the Build OGM session that might be relevant to this particular topic. And it was around dimensions of OGM. And to, in, it's probably oversimplified vis-a-vis -vis the conversation we're having right now, but I, we were sort of framing the notion that there were different dimensions of OGM. One was the content itself, which falls into different categories, but it, it has to do with knowledge, but there's different types of content that, that might be specific facts or connections or background, but we could look at the two other subsets of OGM that has to do with the social connectivity, the types of organizations that connect with one another to try to accomplish things together on similarly chosen goals. And the third one was sort of the philosophy behind why we're doing all of this in terms of what are the underpinnings of our foundational values that are causing us to attempt to work in these ways, in these paths for these outcomes and so forth. And so it, it just seemed to me that we might want to look at how we think about OGM and maybe tagging dimensions so that you could actually go in and say, well, I really just want to know who else is working on X. And there'd be a subset of OGM architecture that would let you 
find other groups that are specifically interested in a certain subset of regenerative agriculture. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a complexify effect on the whole thing. At the same time, it might make it more useful to people over the longer haul. So I just wanted to share that conversation from yesterday. And if you've got more interest, we talked for a while about it. So go listen to that um, recording. Yeah, there was a good long conversation. I think it was Tuesday morning, right? Um, right. That was the, the Bill Joe GM call that started without me and just kept going and kept going. Um, <laughs> yes, they, it did kind of keep going. I had not thought it was going to play, play out that long, but it was an interesting conversation. Stacy's laughing. Um, <laughs> um, one good benefit of this incident is that it's got us talking about important things, which I think was part of the reason Miles was poking his stick into our ribs. Um, and so I'm glad we're having this conversation and I'm actually not happy that he's not in it. Um, so, uh, Sam. Hello everyone. How are you doing? Yeah. So I, you know, I just thought I had a, l a little bit of a responsibility, even though I said this on the list that probably in the past in OGM, there had been kind of debates that maybe didn't go in the in that maybe went in a combative direction but didn't see um the what you all described here today emerge and i feel like probably there's some responsibility on my part for um taking it personally like taking the nastiness that came out of the discussion personally and then reacting that way and so if i hadn't have done that you might not have seen this turn into what it did turn into that I got, I actually, if you read the, if you read what happened, which I'm not even recommending that people do, but if you did, you would see that I got quite combative back to that, to the person and, and then thought better about it later and thought, and actually said, like, I shouldn't have done that and tried to apologize to a lot of people who contacted me individually. And I, and the reason that I'm bringing that up is if you try to talk about maybe it will help if you try to talk about trying to guide people in the community. Um, maybe, I mean, the lesson that I learned is in this community, maybe don't take it. If you, if we don't take things personally, then things probably won't devolve in, into that kind of nastiness. Maybe, you know, maybe it will, but um, I thought I would at least just mention that, that I have, there's, it's not just all miles that cause that level of, nastiness i also got very defensive and like said nasty things to him and told him to i actually was probably the first person to introduce the word fuck into the discussion <laughs> and and then maybe miles you know um took it from there so i just thought i'd mention that and but beyond that i mean i i feel like i'm actually newer here than many people and felt like i understood the vibe and understood the culture but not so much had been exposed to when things were not going in a good direction but anyway i should have known better than to take it take that personally and so anyway maybe that's helpful to people and maybe it's not but i thought i would mention that the other the other thing is that when it comes the other thought that i had related to like if we, if people try to do something is i've noticed that people seem to either come up with a preordained solution and try to route everyone into that, which seems to take away the agency of the other people. And some people are, are aligned with that and say like, that's cool. Let's just do what this one person has wants to make a North star and try to attract everyone in that direction. Or maybe the people that aren't aligned with that begin to dance around the idea of partnering together and creating partnerships, but never actually like, figure out what that's going to be or what the, what they would do with the partnership. I think I've seen when I read all these different discussions that have, that have been going on here, I see people propose directions and say like, let's partner around this and let's partner around that. I think one of, to, to make a step forward and actually do things. If there are people here that want to do that, then support of creating real sustained partnerships where all the participants have agency together is probably going to help. And I talked a little bit with Ken about that yesterday. He took a little bit of time to chat with me. And anyway, I 
that's the thought that I have around around if people wanted to do things together, probably the probably either just choosing one person as a leader and following their orders or figuring out how to be how to bring everyone together in agency and partner are gonna get to that point. Although maybe OGM doesn't have to do anything anyway, really. It doesn't I'm not saying there's some like requirement. Maybe it actually helps everyone do something through the existence of a place to talk about things that we're doing. So, all right, I'm done. Thanks. Um, Sam, thank you. Just a couple of things before I pass the mic to Pete. Um, first, thank you very much for what you just said and for acknowledging your role and, and how things escalated. Um, uh, and I felt like you'd been bounced. I felt like, you know, uh, that, that, that Miles had been unnecessarily harsh with you. Uh, and so you reacted more rigorously than I expected, but then you came back and apologized for it really explicitly and very kindly. And your demeanor on this list is always really thoughtful. And, uh, and so if you, if you spiked at some moment and came back and said, oops, I'm really sorry. I, I like didn't, didn't mean to do that. That's like fabulous and, and, and love that. And then, then kind of what happened was a little bit uh, where things just went out of control because many of us then tried to sort of rein Miles in around it and he didn't listen to any of that at all. It wasn't really kind of connecting with any of the things we were saying, at least it didn't feel like it. Um, but, uh, but this raises really interesting questions like, um, where's the boundary between a list where anything goes and a list where there are certain rules of decorum and uh, or civility and what does that mean when miles said i equate civility with ill will i was like oh man we are in really completely different territory like 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 i do not want to be collaborating with people who think civility is in fact a disguise for southern uh, hospitality or fake friendship or whatever else that that those are not the same thing in, in my head but that opened a really interesting conversation we didn't get to have, right? Which is where are those boundaries? How do those things work? There are a bunch of social media that tried to make room for Trump when he got deplatformed on Twitter with, hey, anything goes over here. And mostly those fail. Mostly the platforms with no rules like fry themselves uh, in, in some way. But, but I think there's, there's places for those kinds of things uh, uh, in the world. But there's, there's a bunch of and if anybody wants to type them in as they occur to you in the chat, that would be great. But there's a bunch of important conversations that spin out of this, this set of events that we ought to come back to uh, over time. Uh, Pete, then Michael, then Allison. Thanks, Jay. And thanks all. And thanks for having this conversation. Um, Sam, I really appreciated what you said. Um, uh, and it, it means a lot to me that you, um, I, I, I wasn't happy to see that you you got overexcited, but I was super, super like, you know, it was extra good to see you pull back and say, hey, that was, you know, not cool. And I, I didn't do it. And then to hear you say it on this call, just amazing. Um, uh, I, I wanted to not say anything. I, I kind of stayed out of this fray um, on purpose. Um, and I kind of wanted to not say anything here because it's kind of not my fight. Um, it's partly not my fight because I could kind of see this coming. And um, I learned, you know, 20, 25 years ago doing this kind of thing that a best thing to do is just kind of step away and let things cool down, right? Um, I, I have to say, and I don't mean this in a mean way, um, but as somebody who's been doing mailing lists for 30 years, I'm kind of disappointed in the group. Um, uh, it's like, you know, what did, what did we expect? You know, we don't have any rules. And I think it's really beautiful that we don't have any rules. Um, uh, it would be an interesting outcome to see that this event makes us so that we finally have to have terms and conditions or suggested guidelines or, you know, codes of conduct or things like that. Um, maybe it's a maturity thing. Maybe we're finally kind of big enough or attractive enough to trolls, uh, people who would be troll-like, excuse me, Mr. Miles. Um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we're big enough that we need a code of conduct. One of the beauties, I think, of OGM as it has been for a couple of years is that we have a really permeable, um, almost to the point of essentially no membrane, you know. Um, 
uh, so, so, and I think we all enjoy that. And I think we've loved it. And I think we've taken advantage of it. Um, we, we, um, each of us perhaps trans transgresses a little bit in a way wow. that we maybe transgresses the wrong word, but we, we, we lean into the fact that we can be more intimate and more trusting and more caring and things like that because we don't have rules about it. Rules kind of, you know, break, um, uh, I, I, it, it's always a little perturbing to me to see a rule because that means that somebody had to say, well, we can't trust ourselves or we can't trust humanity or whatever. So we're going to make a freaking rule. And there's the rule, you know, I really, really, really love it when we can uh, be so sensitive and subtle with each other that we don't have to have rules, that we can kind of negotiate things in real time. And that's one of the things I've loved about OGM. Um, uh, but kind of, kind of there's, a, there's a maturity step where you say, okay, I'm gonna be open to everything. I'm gonna be kind of this, this you know, I'm gonna have kind of Zen interaction with the world. But then if somebody comes and challenges me, I, the, there's an immaturity when we said, oh my gosh, this is bad, you know, because it's like, well, what did you expect? You know, if you're doing this Zen thing out in the world, every once in a while, a whirling dervish is going to come along and, you know, upset the apple cart. And if that's the point at which you go, oh my gosh, I thought we had this social contract where we were all cool with each other and stuff like that. I would have loved to have seen the group level up and do a meta thing, right? We've, we, I think, we failed at the meta thing. It's we we failed to absorb the whirling dervish, um, and and you know the wind ripped into something that should have been diaphanous and strong, and it kind of whipped into a tissue paper that tore itself apart. And I was like, this sucks, you know. Um, so I, I guess maybe the thing that I hope we can do is not have an immediate reaction. Um, not necessarily make rules, even though rules would make it a lot easier to go forward in the future. Um, and especially to have kind of meta consideration around what we wanted to have happen and what we want to do and what happens in the world. And not everything is going to be pleasant, you know, and what happens when things aren't pleasant? Do we cry and, and you know, take our ball and go home or, you know, like start slapping people around and say, hey, you got to get out of my face because you're just too loud. It's like that, you know, we, we missed it. Um, uh, we, we got overheated. Um, we got into boy mode. Um, so one of the one of the weird technology things I've realized about mailing lists, especially in the, in the early days, we had like social conventions and stuff that protected in some sense um, and, and made uh, mailing lists more kind of elastic and able to absorb things. And, and everybody knew netiquette stuff and they also knew not to feed trolls. And, you know, there's a bunch of just stuff that you, you learned early on um, as you entered email space to do or not to do to kind of tamp down social situations. We've, we've lost that, you know, over the past 30 years. Um, for the past 10 years, we, we work with mailing lists differently. So we, so for me, we also have uh, an email list as a sharp-edged technology. Um, it's got a lot of good things. Um, it's super easy to engage. Um, uh, it's super hard to have extra bandwidth. It's super hard to, to tease out the different threads of a conversation. It's super hard to have something that we should have had in this conversation for two years, um, a little gentle thing going, a thread going on in the background. Um, here's, here's what I think OGM is about. Here's what, you know, here's how we, here's how we have a little bit of a fight and then get over it. And here's how, as a group, we react when an interloper comes in, right? Um, as a group, not as individuals in a group, but as a group, right? Um, uh, we, we kind of, we, we took the, we took the ease of use and the comfortability of email and we used that as a benefit. We didn't take on the responsibility for figuring out how to manage our conversations and manage group dynamics in an email list. And then we got bit in the butt by it we, because we hadn't set up that 
resilience. Um, email lists, I think, are a hard place to set up that resilience. Um, the, a forum is better and a chat system is better. Um, uh, so I've I've got a thing with Jerry. We have kind of it's it's become kind of a running joke. You know, it's like the mailing list is is kind of a buzzsaw waiting to happen um, for me. And I think personally, I don't suggest this for the group. Personally, I think we should shut down the mailing list. I think it should be an announce only thing. I don't think it's a good place for conversation. Um, but that hasn't turned into you know we we didn't use the forum very well. We kind of used the chat system. We're using the mailing list like it, it's a good place to, to chat and maybe it is maybe that's what the group wants um, but then there's kind of a responsibility that we have to not go to pieces when the thing that has happened this by the way this dynamic happens you know regularly in mailing lists going back 30 years or 40 years and it's it's a feature of the mailing list. It's just, it's, it's social dynamics and the technology. And, you know, it could have been predicted. It has predicted. It has happened a lot. And the fact that we didn't know that as a group is, I don't know, maybe we, maybe it, it's too much to say that we should have known that in the front in going into it, but it's not a surprise. And this is, you know, picking up a, picking up a sharp edge object and, using it when it's friendly to use and then getting cut by it when you run into the the unfriendly you know um uh edge case shouldn't be a surprise and and we shouldn't get mad at the tool and we shouldn't get mad at the the circumstances which caused the tool to to bite us in the butt so thanks um, Pete, thank you very much um, a lot. A, a couple of things I want to interject real quick. Um, one, back in 1995-ish, I took a workshop at the Omega Institute um, run by Scott Peck uh, about his book, The Different Drum, which is about community building. And I had, I had some several very profound experiences there. Um, but his framework kind of says that most communities are kind of in what he calls pseudo community. They're not really communities. And if things got hard, people would leave. Um, and, and online, by the way, you know, uh, uh, voice action exit, what is it? Uh, online leaving is really easy. You just stop participating, you're gone. You, you don't have to bump into those people you know, uh, in the hallway or at the supermarket or whatever else. Um, but during our workshop, a B got into, we were broken into two big groups of 55. It was a pretty large uh, workshop. And um, a B got into our, our room and then a guy got up and went over and, and, and whacked it. And a woman got upset and that tipped us into chaos in the room. And it was really, really, really interesting because his stages are pseudo community, chaos, em emptying and true community. And one of the things I, I learned from the workshop, I think, was that it takes crises to actually forge community, that, that if we don't go through some events that are significant and figure out how we respond during events and all that kind of stuff, we're just kind of faking it as we go. And there are things you can do to to accelerate that or to bypass that and, and, and like dive more deeply, more quickly. And we haven't done that partly because we're like this really emergent thing. One of the things I'm experimenting with in our conversations here is what does emergence look like? Uh, and, and many of us have deep, big projects that each of us is already working in and doing. And this is kind of the confluence of those projects. I, I used the metaphor of an estuary early on that the estuaries are where salt water meets fresh water, where there's lots, lots of interesting life forms. It's, nutri it's, it's nutrient rich, but it's chaotic. There's all kinds of things going on. So we're a little bit like that. The tools affect this a lot. I happen to really like mailing lists and, and Pete and I every couple months have this back and forth about like, just make it an announcement list. I tried, I tried a bunch and several of us have tried and Rob O'Keefe tried to get us over into discourse uh, a lot and did a really good job of tending over there. And I didn't go over into discourse, but I tried to move us over into Mattermost channels where we could separate out what is OGM and what are we about as a channel. And then we could have a channel for these other sorts of discussions. That's not working. And partly it's not working because email is just so easily available and accessible, which may be one of its downfalls, right? Um, and, then, and then I'll say that sometimes there's really, really simple, clever hacks that, in, that improve discourse. So I'm forgetting where the story was, but one of the online forums that's done really well removed, oh, this is in V Taiwan. I'm pretty sure this comes from V Taiwan and their efforts at civic sort of civic participation and public democracy. They removed the reply button on their comments board. So 
you couldn't reply to somebody else's comment. You had to post a new comment. And elevating new participation to a new comment and making it a wee bit harder to have sort of a, a, a food fight um, on the comment board actually changed the tone of discourse. And it's it, some of these things are just simple, like programmer interface interaction design steps that are known but obscure, uh, you know, in different places that we might avail ourselves of. And we haven't we haven't sort of stepped into that world of kind of redesigning how our conversations work and, and all of that. Sorry, that was longer than I expected, but I just wanted to put those things in the conversation. Um, now back to Michael, Allison, Stewart. Oh, and, a, and a, really quick, a really quick request. When you have the floor, if you raise your hand, if you can keep your hand raised until you, the end of your conversation, then I can look up near the camera towards you. Otherwise, Pete, you were at the bottom of my screen and I was like, ah, oh, man, now I'm looking down. And I can't, you can't move people when there's hands raised in the room. So really tiny thing, but I love sorry. being able to look closer. Sorry, sorry to cut in. Uh, I have to leave. It's dinner time here. And I, I actually got online an hour early because I had the time mixed up. So forgive me for that. Um, lovely to see you all here. Just one little thing as a marine biologist, estuaries are not just pretty places with lots of biodiversity. Uh, on the spring tides, when the salt water comes in and fills the freshwater pools, it kills everything in those pools. When the fresh water goes the other way with floods, it kills everything in the salt water. And so the boundaries are not just a straight line. They are actually flexible boundaries depending on the flux and the flows. And so this is a really critical thing to recognize. The diversity occurs on the boundaries of these fluxes and flows. If it's all the same, then it's not a very diverse ecosystem. So you actually need to create opportunities for disruption to enable evolution to happen but you, at the same time you have to zoom out to watch the individuals and how they participate in order to allow the system to evolve and holding the meta view is hard if you're actually one of the people in the flock so lots of love to you all um and yeah, i look forward to seeing where it goes from here thank Take you care. all the best thank you that was really that was really useful michael over to you mm -hmm. um well since i put my hand up uh, Pete said a big chunk of, of what uh, I had, had wanted to say. Um, I said a little bit of it in, in comments in the chat for those of you who are there, but um, I was really struck in this as an onlooker that um, we, you know, we can't, we can each only control what we can control and you know, we can control our participation in, in things. And um, I felt like we made this a much bigger <coughs> vibration than it needed to be. And I think Sam was, what, what was happening between <clears throat> Sam and Miles was unfortunate but I really wonder if nobody else had piped up at all. If, you know, Miles had said what he said, Sam had said what he said, and then Sam had said, had made the, the graceful apology that he did. And there were already intervening, you know, volleys from others of us, um, whether this whole thing might have died. And, and obviously Miles is a person who like took this on and, you know, put up his, his shields and started throwing spears and defended himself and turned it into this big thing. But we did, we did circle him and, and, and go after him. Um, and, and, you know, maybe he loved it. I don't know, you know, but, but, we we did that and do we want to do that or do we want to figure out how to not do that and see these things coming so that that's one thought i wanted to to share um and the other is you know akin to what pete was saying i do think an email chain is inherently not a great thing not a great way for conversations like the ones we have to take place um, in that somebody was saying earlier, Jerry, I think it might've been you 
you know, gee, I wish that, or maybe it was John, um, something about, uh, you know, upvoting the, the good behavior. And I'm probably not quoting well, but, um, but being able to, to say, oh, this is something we wanna talk about. Let's gather around this. Um, and that if you have a bulletin board, and I don't mean this in the electronic sense, in the, you know, the digital sense, though it is somewhat true there too. If you have a bulletin board where a bunch of people put up a bunch of thoughts, and a Miro board might be like this. If a bunch of people gather around one of those thoughts and start commenting on it because they think it's interesting and it, and it bubbles up and becomes a center of attention, that's a great thing. And if somebody has an obnoxious thought that gets ignored, that, that sort of takes care of itself. When you have all those things happening in a sequence and the obnoxious thing is front and center and people gather around that in, in the sequence and blow it up, what do you expect? I mean, this is, this is gonna happen. And I, I'm glad, you know, I was saying in the chat too, I'm glad that Miles is in here because, you know, circling around Miles is to me not the point. I, I think looking at what we did and how we work and, and what might be better about the way we approach things like this um, is, is really worthwhile. And I, I don't, I think everybody who was in this was in it with good intent. We, you know, we didn't like the way that Miles talked to Sam. Um, there was snark there, but I, I think the way we handled it created a bigger thing than, than uh, it should have. That was what I had to say, along with endorsing most of everything that Pete said. Thanks, Michael. And, and um, I feel like I'm too close in to see, as, as Neil was describing, to see the, uh, the, the dynamics, but I know that it, I know that it escalated in ways, and, and I know that I and several other people were trying really hard to de-escalate and just bring this back down. That wasn't, that wasn't working for any of us because every attempt, and, and there were a bunch of other sort of jabs in the middle of it, but every attempt to sort of de-escalate was met with like, nope, not going to talk about that. I'll talk about this other thing. Well, let me just, I just want to re reply to that. Yeah. Just that, that what you're referring to as de-escalation was done, it, it, it sort of like, it, the, the attempts at de-escalation were criticism and, and calling out in front of the entire group, as opposed to, I mean, if you think of this in a, in a sort of human sense, uh, like, you know, one person, and in this case, Sam, in a way, was that person, you know, saying, hey, hey, man, that, that, was, that wasn't cool. Let's let's just talk about this, and let's. I'm sorry I reacted that way, but you upset me, and it might have in in a real physical group ended up just being something between, you know, between Miles and Sam and the group acknowledging it, but silently. And in this case, it was like competitive de-escalation. You know, we were all, oh, like, you know, this one's attempt to de-escalate didn't work. So let me try my attempt at de-escalation. And, and there was, you know, it was, it was somewhat performative. And honestly, Jerry, you were silent for a long time and then, you know, waded in and your voice obviously here carries a lot of weight and it really became what everything was about. In this in this email chain, um, well, it probably was already. Um, so I, I'm just I'm just calling attention to that. I'm just calling attention to you know the way we behave, and and I, I don't think it requires. I do think there's something to what you had said earlier, or somebody had said earlier about having some clearer purpose um, stated and clearer rules of the road, but not even rules, just like this is what we're doing. You know, this is just, just like, you know, we talk about at times, you know, this is church. 
you know, we come here to like, you know, we're not, we're not actively pursuing a um, specific goal. We're generally aligned around these beliefs and we're tossing around and bringing to attention different things that different ones of us are doing and, you know, trying to support each other. And that's what we do. And, um, and so if you're expecting like a product to emerge from this, maybe you'll be disappointed. Um, if you're expecting, you know, just, just here's what to expect and not, not about rules. Um, anyway, I'm going on too long, but. Um, Michael, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm clearly guilty of having done the focus. The title of my, my email to the list was intentionally you comma miles, um, partly because he had set himself into the group with like a flag and a banner and a flaming torch or something like that. It felt like, and I, I was like, it's kind of fair game because he seems to be playing that role. And I may be totally mistaken by that. Um, um, I'm, I'm leery of rule books and constitutions and other sorts of things, but I think we need some, some explicitness. I like crisp expressions of, in, of intention. I just put uh, Netflix's uh, expense and timekeeping policy, act in Netflix's best interests, five words, uh, which, which is about intention and then leads to, to interesting places, but is I think, I think a very useful shorthand for uh, how we go about doing this, avoiding Hey, uh, you need to book this many hours and this many, you know, this here's the accounting system for sick pay and sick days and sick hours and all that kind of stuff. And here's the kind of note we will accept and the kind of note we won't take when you miss a day of school or whatever other kind of enforcement mechanisms there are. And there's a, there's a long conversation to be had about that. And we haven't talked much about high functioning rule sets or guidelines for communities which exist out there in the world. There's a bunch of those. Um, Allison Stewart Sam. Thank you. Um, it's nice to hear you all. I certainly wasn't, and I'm glad I wasn't part of the, the quagmire that had happened in, in the group, but I'm hearing a lot of ownership from members, a lot of concern, and a lot of desire to understand how to do better and what indeed is the purpose of the group that this seems to invite some discourse about if there's an action focus, um, how, to, how to state a purpose together, how does one's individual purpose meet in with the group purpose at any given time? How do we communicate those things? Um, I think, and I've, I've noticed in the chat too, some interesting allusions to natural systems and the rules, um, biological, physical rules that might be guiding us naturally. And so it makes me think about Eleanor Ostrom, of course, and like, like there are just natural rules. And um, as I try to teach my young people in an emergent economy about where, where we're headed and how to wrap our brains around what it is that we're actually talking about. Um, you know, Gil, you were there in a conversation, you get people talking about economics and you get somebody who's worked in finance is gonna throw out some numbers about what finance is. Uh, is it 7% of the economy? Is it 34% of wait, what is fine? What are the, what are, what are we even talking about? Um, and, and so framing and defining and questioning um, in order to get to the intention or the need of the person. And I know that that sounds like I've mentioned in the chat, this nonviolent communications perspective, but I think that really that's also just a natural rule. Um, we, have, we have needs, that's our life force. It's um, to be creative and to be engaged and to feel like we are impacting and, and connecting through the impact, right? In a positive way, but whatever energy trigger we're getting, if the only experience that we might have is of that negative energy trigger, you know, then that's, that's what we're gonna go for. But that is actually, that energy trigger is potential energy for something that's emergent. Um, when I had first come into the group, I remember like one of the first conversations, this was 
in the heat of the vaccine dialogue and somebody had popped in to say they were just appalled because some people they had previously worked with were not willing to get a vaccine and they couldn't imagine working with these people any longer on solving global issues. And I was kind of like, whoa, wait, wow. <laughs> Is that where we're at with a bunch of adults in a group called Open Global Mind? I can't work with this person because they're making a personal choice that I don't align with. And um, so, so it's nice that this conversation is coming up. It's nice that there's lots of ownership. And I think that when it comes to rules, instead of explicit rules, it's really like understanding this implicit rules of maybe NVC as a model, as a framework, which is simply, what is the need that's trying to be expressed? And if that person isn't skillful at getting to that need, to what extent can I? Because everything is mirrors and projection. And so my own reactivity to the challenges that they're experiencing is reflecting the degree to which that reactivity and that challenge exists within me as well, right? And so, I mean, there's so much ownership about it and of course it will happen. And it's actually, you know, it is okay to, remove from the group to self-remove or to remove somebody else even if the goals and the purpose are continuously being disrupted but maybe that brings us back then too to what is our what is the purpose and um it's to connect it's to maybe be explicit maybe being explicit about that would help guide and along the way and i think i'm trying to I don't know what I'm trying to communicate, <laughs> but, um, but there's something here for me, at least that I'm noticing is when I'm trying to get my young people and other groups to, to think optimally, it's how to notice our senses. I mean, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jeremy Lent, but through his latest book, Web of Meaning, there was, um, a bit of research about how many judges um, they were studied the judges and if they had not had a lunch break they were more likely to <clears throat> to punish mm. the the defendant and if they had just had a lunch they were more likely to acquit them so things that we think that we're making very very objective decisions are really arbitrary based upon our internal ecology and um, so how do we get into touch with detangling our assumptions about others, uh, taking things personally and see that really what we're dealing with at any given point in time is the opportunity to get towards a nugget of truth that's right there in the charge and allow that emergence to take us possibly towards- Jeremy Lent, Web of Meaning. Yeah. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, I'm still wondering about my purpose here, but I think that it, at least in the morning, I can fit it in while people are running off to school before I start my work day. I can feel inspired. I can network with folks. I can test out some ideas and who knows what will come with that, but I'm grateful to all of your self-reflection and high aspirations. So, thank you. Thank you, Allison, very much. Um, Stuart, then Sam. Yeah, um, I just wanted to point out the the difference in bandwidth um, between a virtual uh, forum and and one in real time. If we were all together in a room, this might have ended very very quickly. Uh, by someone, you know, smiling by a touch, by a sense of, um, um, hey, we don't we don't do it this way. There's a much different way of doing it, and the message that 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 meta message may have been um, received, and things might may have quieted down. So, the point of that is to recognize that um, we really need to be much more intentional and mindful about communicating in this forum, especially when stuff starts to get a little um, 
edgy or when there's disagreement so that it doesn't move into um, the armed conflict. Um, I, I think that there are both implicit and explicit um, ways of articulating um, how we want to be with each other. And, and the last thing I want to say, and I'm not sure what the connection is, but while we're talking about what, what was fomented here, there's a real tyrant out in the world who is just creating um, absolute chaos in terms of a world order at so many different um, levels. Um, unfortunately, I need to run and I look forward to listening to the remainder of the call. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks for your contribution. Uh, Sam. Oh, yeah, I, I uh, well, listening to all of this, I, it got me thinking about, <clears throat> for several years, I participated in an online community called Brainstorms that was founded by Howard Rheingold. And it was really, it was, the, the, the people there reminded me a lot of the people that are here, and I'm still connected to a lot of those people. And that's probably how I ended up here. I would, would imagine if maybe some of you were part of brainstorms i can't recall because i haven't participated in a while but the, the reason i brought it up is when howard created that online discussion he kind of he and the other people that worked with him decided to set a bunch of rules you know and that's one way of doing it and so you with those rules set it was there you would, would literally read these rules when you entered the community and understand that this was intended to be kind of like it was considered to be like the home of the people that were already present when you're entering and you wouldn't come into someone's home and start knocking all the furniture over and calling them jerks and so on and it would just kind of set that tone for you and that but they would actually do something about it if you broke those rules and so you could so basically if you're a new participant there you could predict what's going to happen if you if you kind of started to break the norms and the culture that was in that community. And I feel like given that this community didn't have rules, I feel like actually it was, the response was pretty okay compared. I saw when people actually did the same kind of thing in Howard Rheingold's brainstorms and what they would, what they would come and would just warn people. They'd say, this is your first warning. You're going to be kicked out of this group if you keep acting that way. And that, but that's, I'm not saying that this is what OGM should do at all. I'm just saying like, that's one way of solving the problem. And also definitely that whole discussion was happening in a forum software, but it doesn't really matter whether it's happening in forum or, or email list or whatever. Um, they tried to shape it so that you would understand like you're not in person. This is not going to be an in-person interaction. You're going to be reading this and it's going to be coming intimately from your mind into words. And everyone's going to see all of your words. And, and so basically, there's a, like more transparency around it. So in, in the case where we don't have rules, and someone else brought up um, Ostrom and the commons, and I think if you read the case studies that Ostrom did, what happened every time, the pattern that she found was that if people didn't have an existing rule set, they would do exactly what we're doing and recognize first, like there's this common thing that we are all sharing and begin to realize like, how can you keep this, sustain this, or how can you ruin it by whatever actions you might take and start talking together about like, what does that mean for all of us? All right, we're all using this commons. How do we, how are we gonna work together to sustain and maintain that? That's the pattern that she's, that she described in her and and that she codified into the work that she did in the books that she wrote and all that kind of stuff her and her husband both was she just wanted to observe how people were doing this and so i feel like that's what you all are doing right now and i also feel like when the issue came up in the community given that there was no like protocol for how to deal with it you know i try to suggest that people move on but some people voice privately to me or or publicly they're like no i'm kind of you know, this is important. We, we feel like this, we need to address what happened here. And I feel like it kind of went organically. So some of what Michael Grossman said happened, but I, since no one person was like in charge of how everyone's reacting to the situation, <laughs> you know, then things just unfolded. 
And I feel like in the end, the community was able to heal itself and things probably didn't go the way that everyone would hope that it would. But also, if you want to create a commons approach to it, then like ev everything that everyone here is talking about now is probably going to be the way to do it, to actually be, to discuss and decide together, recognize what the shared resource is, and then figure out how you can either keep growing it or how you can destroy it. And I don't really, I don't think there's any fundamental answer other than maybe looking at that. So I just wanted to say that in reaction to some of the things that folks were talking about here. Thanks, Sam. Um, two things, maybe synthesizing a little bit of what, what we've come to so far. Two things um, to put in. One is I asked in the chat, like, what is it that we're nurturing here? And I think, I think, and we've had many a conversation over two years almost about what is OGM, what is our purpose, how do, how do you OGM, OGMing as a verb, et cetera, et cetera, what is OGME? And I think one of the things that we're actually nurturing here is this little flickering conversation in the middle of the group um, that uh, many of us find really fruitful, useful, warm. It's like a campfire uh, uh, and productive in some sense, because I think it feeds many of our own projects where we run away from here and go do our own thing in, in other kinds of places. And in part, OGM is trying to do more things and, and build some stuff in the middle. And that's flimsy and in the middle and not, not very well organized. But the conversation is, is uh, warm, but not hot um, in a way that is convivial and so forth. And the second thought is, and what happened when Miles stepped in in the way he stepped in was, I think he was damaging that conviviality. I think he, I think he, he actually, his demeanor really put a dent in, he, he harshed the chill is I think what one person uh, wrote back on the list. And I'm like, mm, yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I think he was doing so intentionally and with his own set of sort of guidelines for behaving and getting things done in the world, which was like, hey, we need to figure out like like i've been in i think the unspoken narrative and he was a, a little bit explicit about this was i've been in so many conversations that have a really nice time and good go no place and you you all look like one of those and hey i'm gonna i'm gonna like drop um there's a kind there's a breed of dog called a turn spit which was bred intentionally as a small dog to turn the spit in a roasting fireplace for cooking in inns uh, in, in Europe, I don't remember, I don't know what country they come from. <clears throat> might have been Holland, might have been England. And you drop a hot coal into the little turner with the, the, the where the where the dog is, um, because uh, that keeps the dog running on the on to turn to keep your roast turning on the fire. And I think he was dropping a hot coal into our conversation quite intentionally because that's his demeanor. And all of us were like, wait, 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 we don't we don't harsh that way. We don't. That's not the vibe, that's not the way we want to do it. And he was raising a series of really interesting questions and important questions for us. And maybe this is me, but when the process breaks, I pay attention to process and then go back to the important questions. And that's, that's me. Uh, and that happens in my personal life too. Like when process breaks, I go handle process and try to get back into a place where we can understand each other. And then I worry about, okay, how do we get more things done? What are the rule sets we should hang by the door? Where's our door? Um, you know, where, how are we, where are we, where are we holding this conversation? All those other kinds of things. So, um, so then's, then's a couple of thoughts I wanted to put in. Where does that leave us? Anyone who hasn't stepped in to the conversation and would like to um, take a turn, please do. Stacy. Okay. So to go back to this idea of rules and gently pushing, um, I mentioned in a earlier in an, in another place that for me this was a really difficult process. At first, I didn't want to jump in because I was aware that I may be breaking rules by diverting the conversation, and it was really hard for me. And when I finally did jump in, I received a lot of you know private correspondences that I was doing a good job and going in the right direction. And then um, somebody privately emailed me in a way that made me feel like I was gently being told that I was breaking the rules. 
And that was really difficult for me because I felt what I was doing was right. And I was being told, don't do that. So I just want to put that out there because it's, we have to balance, you know, our behaviors. And like Neil said, there are boundaries and it's amorphous. Thanks. Thanks, Stacey. And I think from the start of OGM, given it's more or less shared objectives, which, which is its own interesting conversation, but we've always known uh, and thought that people we bounce in, we would bump into people who were, who felt, acted, believed very differently from more or less the rough consensus of this group and that we would then have to deal. And that, I think that's a piece of what happened here. And, and it wasn't so much on objectives, it was on process, um, but there was a piece of that. Um, well, Pete, Pete's asking in the chat, if he didn't give a shit about us, why did we give a shit about him? Why did we get so upset if he was literally meaningless to us? For me, it was because his mere presence sent a chilling effect through the room. And I had been trying for the previous month to pull together uh, one of these calls where we were talking about our process and where we were doing exactly the opposite, which was how do we improve our process to make room for people who don't feel like they can speak up, for room for people who are underrepresented, room for people who are intimidated by uh, a bunch of people posting fancy stuff about studies and, and, and philosophy and, and whatnot. Like, like I, I was actually actively heading in the other direction. And then here comes this guy with a wrecking ball. And I, I personally felt enormous empathy for the people who might not want to speak on this list again, never mind the ones who left, because of his approach and attitude. Because who wants to be the next person in the, in the crosshairs of the, of the flamethrower? Like almost nobody. So Pete, please. It, it was just words. Yeah. Why, why would somebody, I, you know, especially like maybe, maybe there's a, um, maybe there's a theory here that, that, he was of low emotional affect and didn't know he was a bull in a china shop and 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 wasn't absorptive of our entreaties to be nicer right why why would that have a chilling effect on a room so i my argument here is that as a group we don't have a kind of cohesion that can have curiosity about something like miles rather than um a reaction we had an angry reaction to somebody who was literally all he did was type words and send them into the ether and that was like oh my god the world has fallen because you know he said some things I, it's like as a group I, I think we failed at group cohesion there. And what happened was, I, th I think, I, I didn't follow this very carefully, and I apologize for my anti-empathy in, in, in even caring about this whole thread, but um, we failed at group cohesion. And what happened more or less was Miles's perturbance set off one or two of us, and that set off others of us and that set off others of us it caused a chain reaction where if if we had acted cohesively if we had a sense of the group rather than of ourselves we would have just kind of watched him like barge into the middle of this, this thing and spout one or two of us would have said hey miles this is really curious or i'm you know this is really interesting tell me more or hey miles you know i'm i'm not sure that this conversation fits this group um uh, maybe we you know maybe you're just too disruptive and and we're we're not interested in talking we got into it kind of individually in pell mell and it was you know a tempest in a teapot kind of it it wasn't to take a real world example, it wasn't missiles coming into, you know, uh, the, the middle of our towns. He, he didn't literally blow anybody up. He didn't literally kill anybody. He didn't literally, it was just fricking words. We overreacted. And I think part of the way we overreacted was it, it didn't, you know, the, 
it was enough to to bubble us up we we did a chain reaction but i i think we should really think about why we overreacted rather than talking about how terrible miles was miles is the m least important part of this whole conversation to me right and and all i hear is miles did this and miles just did that and miles was you know didn't listen to us and we tried to tell miles and it's like frick why is miles the center of this conversation rather than the group the group and its reactions and how we hold cohesion how we hold each other how we're curious about perturbation rather than defensive is is where i'm at thanks um pete thank you um a couple things i love why didn't we respond with curiosity instead of anger um i do think words matter a whole bunch because we've been here almost two years and all we've done is words like we've got words words got us where we are and my metaphor words, of the, words matter when they matter but they don't have to matter oh yeah and 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 like accept things like let things run off your back is i think a like good way to go about things and i think words mattered we, we thought you know miles's words oh my gosh miles's words matter to somebody else in the group he's going to hurt somebody else i have to go protect them you there know, was a like, lot of that. There was a lot if, of that. Was that wrong? If it's, it's, I'm going to say a word and I don't mean it in a mean way. It's a sign to me of group immaturity. And I think as individuals, we have a lot of maturity. As a group, we didn't have trust that, that all of us together would say, oh, that's interesting, rather than, you know, a bunch of us for whatever reason, um, and, and I have to say, by the way, um, speaking as a guy, a, a lot of the reaction was the guy thing, right? Um, a lot of us reacted because we thought we wanted to protect everybody else. And, you know, we didn't trust that everybody else could protect themselves, that everybody else would know what was going on, that everybody else would, would see a bunch of what we think of like in, in this group we've talked about it as his words didn't have meaning it didn't have context it didn't understand us right they shouldn't have bothered us and they did so, but i think it was by proxy yeah so i'm i'm kind of trying to hold a community here and i was getting a whole bunch of side traffic from people extremely irritated and upset by the whole thing now whether that happened when the escalation happened and everybody started jumping in i don't know I should go back and look, um, but but I was extremely conscious, and this may be an error on my part, but I was extremely conscious that a bunch of people might not want to post or talk on this list ever again if they knew that Miles was still on the list and might jump on them at any moment. And when I took Miles off the list at his request last night, I then told the community he's no longer on the list because unless everybody knows that he's actually functionally not on the list, everybody's like, he's going to jump out from behind the curtain at any moment. And I'm again, personalizing this to Miles, but, but he, but I think I agree with um, what you're saying, Pete, in the sense of our response was immature. It was a bit of the response of when somebody from outside comes over and picks on one of the community and everybody surrounds them and says, you're a bully, you're a bully, stop, 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 go away. Or something like that. We, we did that. Um, now, if we had an explicit set of guidelines, however firm or however gentle and, and generic, uh, do you think that Miles would have responded to one of us pointing to the guidelines and saying, hey, dude, this is how we operate. You're breaking rule six. I, I, think, it, I think it doesn't matter. And I apologize to the folks with the raised hands. So I'm going to jump in here. Um, I'm, I, I'm thinking of a social list that I've been on forever. Um, that died because of Facebook. Facebook, I hate you because of that. Um, it was one of the things, so, so one of the things that happened was every once in a while, two people would get in a fight, two people who were list members would get in a fight and everybody kind of rolls their eyes. And some people would go, hey, you know, um, you and you, this, this is bullshit. I'm going to put down my computer. I'm going to come back in a week. And I hope you guys have settled it by then, right? So um, another thing that, that happened um, often was 
an interloper would come in and spout nonsense and like much like miles and everybody knew to just and I don't even know if email systems do this anymore, but everybody knew you just like mute the guy. It's like, okay, you know, this is one of those, somebody just brought something really stinky into the room. <clears throat> you have the technology just to literally not see that ever again, right? And then, um, and then for the really, really, really stinky people, what would happen is a few people would engage, like we engaged Miles, and then people would say, uh, you know, hey, Pete, uh, please stop replying to Miles or I'm going to have to to mute you as well, right? And I don't want to mute you, but I don't want to see anything from Miles and you're you're feeding into my filters, right? Um, so we don't, I, you know, so the whole Miles situation um, with the technology of, uh, you know, of, of 1995, um, would have just blown over. It would have blown through and blown over and nobody would have cared. And Miles would have been shouting into the wind. And interestingly enough, on that list that I'm on, there were two or three people who would be like, oh my God, this is the most exciting thing ever. I love what Miles is saying, or I, I love teasing him, or I love, you know, uh, I love when he teases me or whatever, right? And it's like, okay, whatever. I'm glad I don't have to see that. The, you know, so, it's it's this weird thing where we it feels like you know we're we're boiled by this tempest in a teapot <laughs> it's like i don't know why we're doing that why are we talking about guidelines when we don't even need that so i guess maybe the thing to do is you know level up our our use of the technology um and and only a little bit right and this kind of thing doesn't have to be a problem um Pete, thank you for what you just said. A bunch of light bulbs went off in my head because of how you said it and what you said. I appreciate that a lot. Um, and I think I was under the impression that you would love us to have some written guidelines and that that's really important to hang by the door, but I didn't hear you just say that. No, I would hate that. Okay. I um, mean, that that is actually, and um, uh, I think it was Stuart talking about Howard, that's the classic thing to do, right? And And actually, when I see a little nascent community forming, it's like, you guys need codes of conduct, by the way, um, either either because of an interloper or because of some guy is gonna do some classically guy stupid thing. And then you need to be able to point to the rules on the wall and say, hey, don't be that guy. Um, the they, a thing I love about OGM is that we haven't done that and we haven't needed to do that. Um, and it would make me sad actually to say that, okay, well, we've finally grown up to the point where we have strange things happening and we have to have rules. I, rules to me are a sign of, so, you know, there's, there's the immaturity of you don't even need to need rules. You, you don't realize you need rules. And then the, another level of maturity and immaturity is, well, we found out because of a mild situation that we need rules. Um, you know, somebody posts a sign uh, someplace that says, don't spit on the sidewalk. It's like, okay, well, that meant that somebody was stupid enough to spit on the sidewalk at some point, and then we made rules. The level of maturity above rules is everybody knows what to do kind of magically and socially. Social, social cohesion and, and unwritten rules is, to me, a sign of maturity above rules. And that's where I like to live. I like to live with people who know what to do rather than living with people who have to be told what to do by rules. Because the rules are always, they're always stupid in some way, right? There's gonna be a, a case where you need to break a rule and then you're either breaking a rule and that should be a rule that you should never break rules or you know, you can't do the thing that, that you wanted to. So social, social convention and unwritten, unwritten rules, unspoken rules and compassionate discussion about and what happens when you've matured into a society that doesn't need rules is not that you never have conflict, not that somebody doesn't do wrong things, but that you can have mature conversations around it. Um, uh, you, you, you know, the, the people involved, you know, one of them says to the other one of them, hey, can we go discuss this um, over drinks over here? And then the discussion might get really heated. It might be like, 
you were an idiot to me. You hurt me. You hurt that other person. I can't believe you did that. Why did you do that? And you have a discussion about what happened, right? And you come to some understanding of what happened. You probably apologize to each other. You agree not to do it again, whatever. Maybe you come back to the group and you tell the group, you know, that that night in, um, in community circle around the campfire, by the way, I worked it out with uh, Jim because, you know, I, I thought Jim had stepped on my foot because he was a nasty bastard. It turned out that um, he's got a bum knee and he, he stumbled onto me and we worked it out. Or Jim has agreed never to, to do that thing where he likes to go up and punch people because he thinks it's funny. You know, I, I finally, we talked about it. I told him that it's not funny. It doesn't, I, you know, it hurts me. It, it doesn't, you know, and he's, he's agreed not to do it again, right? So. I, it's not that I don't like rules, but when you write them down, you've failed. You've failed to be a society, I think. Um, really quickly, I'm going to share screen with my brain because I put this link in the chat earlier. This is an important piece for me. We pass laws and impose rules when discourse fails. And this is supporting what Pete is saying right now. It's under my beliefs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll stop the share. And I'd love to go to Stacy and Doug to take us out of the call because we're sort of at our time. Thank you, Pete. I really agree with everything that you said. And so I also wanna point out a distinction because what caused me to chime in is when a third person came in and mischaracterized Sam. And I didn't think at that point as a community that he was in the right place to clear up that misinterpretation. Specifically, it was said that Sam wouldn't listen to any critique that didn't agree with him, something, something to that effect. And to me, that was missiles, not intentional missiles, but that was a moment that I think it was worthwhile to step in just to clear that up, if, if nothing else. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Doug, I think you'll, um, and, and Michael, if you'd like to step in as well, let me know you were in the queue earlier, but I just wanna make sure to, to pick up Doug because he hadn't spoken yet. But, let me know after. Well, my, my not speaking has been in a way of saying what I think about this conversation, but I'm going to put it like this. Uh, every one of us has a consciousness that's floating on a cauldron of hot emotions, and we keep that controlled. And part of the problem for me with this group is that people talk too long, which I think is a way of avoiding their own cauldron. Uh, I like it when the cauldron leaks through because it's a message from the world uh, and worth understanding. And my own participation here is that I want, I'm so interested in what people are thinking about. So if they do things that get in the way of keeping me from grasping what they're thinking about, like uh, perseverating in their speech, uh, uh, I pull back uh, and hope for greater clarity and a little bit more emotion. Um, Doug, thank you. And um, I think that's a really like nice end note because it's gonna have a bunch of us reflect on. Uh, I thank you all for being here. And I don't mean just today. Um, I, Pete and others have put ways that we might level up our community and our way of being together here that we should think about. Um, it would be nice if we use some of the Mattermost channels to discuss uh, some of these topics as well. That might be a more uh, grounded and civil place to, to have the discussion and easier to sort of go back and see what we said and how we said it. So if we could take this over, Pete, what's the best Mattermost channel do you think for this sort of topic? Uh, I think it's OGM calls right now. Okay, just the OGM calls. Okay, so the same place where I post, I, I will post this recording later today to that channel. Let's use that channel to talk about this. Um, uh, Michael, did you want to step in at all? I, I did just want to say on that, that um, in the Mattermost channels, one of the advantages is if something happens in one discussion in one channel, it's not dominant so i almost think the multi-channel availability is a good thing if you want to have a discussion about like you know this discussion purported to be about you know open source business models 
And if there had been an open source business model conversation where everybody was there for that and there had been a bad exchange, we wouldn't all have seen it and leapt in and you know it might have governed itself a little bit more easily. Um, the other thing about that I wanted to say about Mattermost is let's use those emojis. <laughs> let's let's upvote stuff and you know <laughs> and I what I wish about Mattermost and and what I was talking about about people gathering around a post is like that you could say okay what's what's loved right now what what are people what are people gravitating toward and you know you can see that there's activity in a particular channel and that's good but it could be good or bad um anyway I just want to say that about how we could gather in matter most but thank you i appreciate that to matter most i i agree uh judy you've got the last word just one quick comment i love the idea of doing most of this in matter most especially because we can sort into channels but but I would caution that we need to be careful about how many channels we end up having because it could easily proliferate and subdivide and, and become very complicated. Um, and I'm not the expert at dealing with that, but I just want to suggest that we give some thought to specific channels defined in certain specific ways or something that's not too constraining but doesn't allow proliferation of thousands of channels. <laughs> Thanks. and and. Pete occasionally goes and weeds channels and tries to, you know, take any any channels that are not uh, active. Or not relevant. yet, but it's coming up. So. Pete intends occasionally to weed the channels and. <laughs> I, I like channel proliferation. Another thing about channels is that you can have rules about a channel. I think that's a, a, rules are a good thing for a channel, right? This right. is the, the channel where we talk about open source monetization, and then when it goes off the rails, it's like that's a great conversation, and it's not here; it's over in the other room. Sweet. All right, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Really nice to see you all. Thank you, everyone. Ciao.